Moments with Mo. Brought to you by Zenith Bank and GE. Basically, every row of three seats on a commercial airplane contains at least one passenger who'd really rather not be there. However, many have dismissed the fear of flying as irrational, while others relish the opportunity to kiss the skies as the aircraft attains cruising altitude. Tonight on the show, we have a story of an air travel gone bad. Yeah. Do you like flying? Um... I used to when I was younger because it meant that I was going to a different country or I was going holiday. to a different state. Yeah. But ever since I got older, I do not enjoy it as much. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily because I'm very uncomfortable when it comes to the air conditioning and my nose. Just the lack of, you know, fresh air really affects my mm -hmm. sinuses and stuff like that. What yeah. about you? I do have a fear of flying because just a little bit of turbulence, I start freaking out. Mm. Or I'm not one of those people like my mum is terrible. If you're sitting, she, her sitting next to me on a flight scares me more than I was. Okay. It, it you know, I actually want to share with you, you said you have a fear of flying, mm. and I want to share a little bit what I have here. Okay. It says that the fear of flying is an expression of being a control freak. Um, there's a term called aerophobia, mm -hmm. and it is common amongst individuals who cannot hand over control to someone else. This type of individual generally feels indisposed in any situation they feel beyond their control. Such individuals often ex exhibit low confidence in people or the systems around them. Characteristically, they exhibit extremely confident personalities. However, the mere thought that a situation is beyond their span of control is likely to trigger involuntary biological responses such as anxiety, nervousness, and palpitations. So huh. that's the concept of aerophobia, which basically so, means you're afraid of flying. I will say I am a control freak. Yeah. You are. So I agree with that. you as well. There's nothing wrong with it. I think, though, the thing about when you're flying is um, they always talk about how people always use this analogy where they're like, oh, you get on a plane. And I mean, most people, for the most part, mm. are confident in the system. They're confident that, you know, they're going to get on a plane. They're going to land where they're mm. going to land safely, you know, um, and I think that it's good to continue to be confident because mm. I think it would be horrible to get on a flight and the whole time you're afraid that something bad is going to happen. Yeah. But I think in the cases of people who are afraid of flying, I think that may have something to do with it. Getting on a flight and thinking something bad is going to happen. Oh, I mean, if you're that afraid, you won't get on the flight. Mm -hmm. There's a fear of flying, but you can still fly. And I think there is, if it's a proper phobia or whatever... I don't think you can get on a plane. Like, I know people who have not traveled for years because they just, it's a really big ordeal. So yeah. they, won't even, they won't even fly or go on holiday or whatever. Yeah. They'd rather drive somewhere, you know? Yeah. So do you have a phobia for flying? We went out to sample opinions on this. Let's take a look as we go to break. I don't have a phobia for flying. Uh, come on, I don't. It's, it's, it's cool flying. Whew. Yes, I have a fear of flying because... I'm scared of crashing. Oh, not at all. No, I don't have a phobia for flying. A phobia for flying? Um, no, I actually do like flying a lot. When we took off, it balances. But rather than turning, mm -hmm. we were going down. Dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back. We had a chat with someone whose flying phobia is well-founded. She was one of the nine survivors in the 2006 ADC air crash in Nigeria. Here's what went down. Hello, Esther. Welcome to Moments with Mo. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your story with us today. Thank you. So in 2006, which is about eight years ago, you were one of the survivors of a plane crash. Can you tell us what happened to you that day and just, just explain to us what happened? Well, I can only say from my own view, mm. which was what happened to me on that day. Okay. Well, it was a regular Sunday. I woke up. I had been in Lagos a, year, a week earlier, actually, and I was returning to Sokoto where I was a youth copper with the same airline that crashed anyway. So I wasn't feeling very well when I woke up that day, mm. but I 
didn't actually want to go back. Okay. But my dad being the disciplinar disciplinarian that he is, mm. when you say something, you have to do, do it. it. Yeah. So he was like, I can't just not go back on that day. Okay. So I didn't confirm my flight. So I got to the airport that morning and I was told the flight was fully booked. Mm. But luckily for me, since I was serving with the airline, okay. I had to go to the counter, ask to see the manager that I had to be on that plane that day. Mm. I had to go back to Sokoto on that day. After going back and forth over and over, all they said was that the flight was fully booked, but I should just go and go to the aircraft that the lead crew, late Kano Christian, mm would find a seat for me that there could be people who wouldn't come on time okay. yeah. people would miss the flight and they would just fix me somewhere so i got to the stairs and then i waited for everybody to board when they were done kind of said to me esther just go straight to the back so i said that'll be fine so i got the i can't remember what seat number it is now but i know it was the seats are actually labeled D, F, mm -hmm. and then I was on the E seat, and there was a gentleman. Is that the middle seat? That's the middle one. Okay. And there was a gentleman on the D. Mm. Okay. And the flight usually goes from Lagos to Abuja, Abuja to Sokoto. Okay. So when we got to Abuja, the guy highlighted. And then my neighbor, who is also a youth copper, mm. okay. joined, us from, uh, joined us in Abuja. And okay. Esther and I were not exactly in a Her perfect... Name is Esther as well. Yes. Okay. She survived as well anyway. Okay. We were not exactly in a perfect friendship state okay. at that point mm -hmm. in time. But there was just something that came to me when I saw her. I was like, I called her by her son name. Mm. And she was like, who knows me here? Mm. Then she joined me. So I moved to the D seat. Right. And then she, she took the E seat. seat. Okay. Is the, sorry, is the D seat by the window? The D seat the is aisle? on the aisle. So the aisle and she's in the middle now? Yeah, she's in the middle okay. and then the seat there by was, the window. And was there anyone by the window? No. Okay. It was just two of us okay. Okay. at the back. And then the crew were just behind mm -hmm. us. Where the flight was delayed for a bit mm -hmm. because there was no fuel at that time or there was some form of fuel scarcity. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it started drizzling. So I was saying to Esther in Pidgin English that mm -hmm. What kind of rain is this? Mm. And she's like, is there anyhow, let's just get to Sokoto. When we took off, it balances, then turns. Okay. When it was supposed to balance, we had the sharp drop. Okay. Right. And then Nigerians in their typical self, yay, yay. Mm, yeah. And it was, everybody quietened, and then it balanced. But rather than turning, mm -hmm. we were going down. In your flight from Lagos to Abuja, did you notice anything strange about the plane? No, Abuja to, um, Lagos to Abuja was, was fine. fine. Okay. It was fine. Mm. Okay. And then we're heading downwards and everybody was screaming. Mm. You could hear people shouting wow. and I held on to Esther. Exactly. And the only thing I remember, even till this moment, it's still very, very, very clear to mm. me, was blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, Holy mm. Ghost fire. And the next thing, I didn't know what happened again. The only thing I remember after the accident and even till now mm -hmm. is that I was, we were not moving anymore. I was static. Okay. okay. And I was heads down. As in your, your head was facing down? Yes, okay. I was heads down mm -hmm. and then my belt was, I was still strapped to my belt. Okay. So obviously I must have blacked out mm -hmm. at, from that time to when I got, remember that. The first thing I did was looked to left and right, downwards, and I didn't see anything. And then, you remember when you watch too many American films, mm. and then you start thinking in your head, is anyone here? Yeah. Mm. Can anybody hear me? Those and were the first were words yes, that came out from my mouth. And I didn't hear anything. It was just quiet. Mm. But somewhere, I just remembered, oh, Esther was right behind, beside me. So I said, Esther, Esther, are you there? And she said, yes, I'm here. I'm like, okay. That was when I just got some form of energy mm. or some form of strength to just remember that I had a belt and then I just had to just lift mm -hmm. the lid mm -hmm. and then I was free. And when, when you came out of your seat, did you fall? Or was, was the plane in an angle where you were going to fall down? No, no, no. Where we were, we were still seated. Okay. It's just I was face down. Mm. And then when I said to Esther, are you there? She said, yes. So I said, okay. 
we need to leave this place. Yeah. Okay. Esther, sorry to cut you off there. We have to take a quick break. Okay. We'll be right back with you. Thank we'll you. be right back after this. And then they told us we had to move to National Hospital. Okay. By the time we got to National Hospital, I couldn't stand again. Dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back. We are still here with Esther, one of the survivors of the 2006 ADC plane crash. So before the break, Esther, you were telling us that you had woken up, the plane had crashed, and you came out of your, you came out of your seat. Mm -hmm. So tell us what happened next. So Esther and I walked out, mm -hmm. and then we stood at the side. Then there's this cabin crew friend of mine, Peter. I just saw him lying. The, the, site actually looked like a dump yard okay. and he was in between right on the seat and there were two ladies i think uh -huh. their chairs fell on each other one okay. was down the other was on top and you could say the one on top was really weak and lifeless mm. and the one below was just trying to push and get, get herself out, out. Okay. so we so i said to esther let's help this lady so we bought unstrapped her and mm -hmm. she stood so she was the third person standing with us mm -hmm. somewhere in my mind i don't know what i was thinking at that point rather than help peter all i said was peter come now come come mm -hmm. come and be with us and he didn't, he wasn't moving and we were there and then there was a first explosion when you saw the girl underneath who was struggling to get out, what is, what, can you explain the conditions of the plane? Was it smoky? Could you, could you see far ahead of you? What could you see exactly? At that point, I wasn't really looking. Okay. I could have looked and didn't see anything because mm. my mind wasn't exactly there. Okay. Yeah. But what I could remember was that the portion where we were mm. was cut out. Okay, so the plane was, was divided. Not exactly divided. Our part was cut out. There were some parts that were in pieces. Right. And there were some parts that were still a bit one form, mm. but not attached to where we were. Okay. Right, okay. So, because like, there are three, there's an aisle, and then mm. there's three seats here, and then three mm. seats to the right and to the left. Yeah. It was from the aisle to where we, that's D-E-F, okay. that was intact. The can't remember okay, what is labeled now. Mm. The other three parts, mm. that place was actually scattered. Wow. It wasn't in one form. Okay. 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 So most likely that's where the other girls were. Okay. So when we picked her up, she was a third person. And then I remembered I wasn't wearing my shoes and my handbag wasn't with me anymore. So <laughs> it's actually very funny now mm. because that's the silliest thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. Then I thought I needed to go back and mm. look for my shoes. Wow. So, I so went, were you already out of the plane? Yes, I was. Mm. Wow. Yes, we were. Yeah. And then I went back, checked where we were sitting, and I didn't find my shoes. Did this happen before the explosion? After the first explosion. After the first explosion, yeah. you still went back to get your shoes? Okay. Wow. And I told Esther to watch out the fire for me. What wow. part of the plane had exploded? It was just a sound in the vicinity. Okay. I really cannot say but possibly the engine, maybe. Okay. I don't know, I really can't say. Was the fire close to where your shoes were? I hadn't found my shoes at that point, okay. so mm -hmm. I really didn't know where it was. So, but the second time I went in, I didn't check where I checked before. I checked the opposite end, and then I found my shoes there and my handbag. Okay. So I got my shoes and my handbag outside, and then I brought out my phone, mm. and the only number in my head was my dad's number. Mm. So I, was, I remember still sh shaking and punching, really and I said to my dad, Daddy, Daddy, the plane had crashed. And, what did and you say? he said, what did you say? Mm -hmm. And for a while, I didn't hear his voice. Yeah. And then he was like, are you there? I said, yes. Are you OK? I said, fine, I'm fine. He said, are you injured? I said, I can still walk. 
He said, who is there? I said, because my dad makes it a habit when I'm not at home to call, to have numbers of people around me. Okay. So he knew Esther as okay. well. So I said, Esther is here. She joined from Abuja. So he said, okay, it's a plane crash. Everybody will soon know. Mm. Okay. You would get help. So he cut. So at that point, we had the second and third explosion. explosion. So I said to Esther, we need to leave this place. Mm. We didn't know where we were going to, but it was a farmland with maize, and we were just walking on the footpath we saw. Was there anyone else that had survived the crash? Was there anyone else around at that point that you could see? At that point, it was just myself, mm. Esther, and the other lady okay. that were standing. Mm. But I knew Peter was still there. Okay. So we walked away, and on our way, we met the ambulance and that they drove us, drove us to the clinic or hospital, hospital the one at the airport. So tell us what happened when you got to the hospital. We were in the clinic for a while. At that point I really didn't even know there was something wrong with me. Okay. Until we stayed there for some minutes mm -hmm. and then they told us we had to move to National Hospital. Okay. By the time we got to National Hospital I couldn't stand again. Oh, wow. So they had put me on a wheelchair and mm. then pushed me into the hospital. That was when I began to feel pains in my leg. Oh, wow. And then while we were still there, they were rushing people in. Okay. So it's, you, you look at yourself and you say to yourself, was I really Did that with really these happen? People? Yeah. So those were the people, other people from the crash, the yes. other survivors. Yes, badly injured. Yeah. Because even the third lady, she was wearing the regular, um, the lace skirt and blouse, mm, but okay. half of it was, was gone. gone. Wow. So it, you could see her, and like, I was wearing this jacket, mm. and funny enough, this is the only That's the thing only... I could find that happened can to me. Can you just shut it up so everyone can see it really well? Wow. It's still intact. And then I just have that yeah. cut behind. Have over there. The bottom there. Yeah, and I don't have any cut on my back. Just, just nothing. So you said that your legs were beginning to hurt you. What, what exact, what, were, what, what injuries did yeah. you sustain? I had a pelvic fracture, but it's a minor pelvic fracture. Wow. I mean, I'm in so much shock because mm. um, hearing your story is extremely, I mean, it's, it's shocking. Yeah. And it's also extremely encouraging. But what exactly were you feeling at that moment when you were now in the hospital? You've seen other people around you who you know, they're not doing very well. What were you feeling? For 24 hours, I think I was numb. Okay. I wasn't actually feeling anything. Mm. So how long were you in the hospital for? Three days. For three days. Okay. I okay. left on the third day. Okay. And where did you go to? I came back to Lagos. Okay, yes, I want to talk about that. <laughs> so, okay, you've experienced serious trauma. Mm. You're in the hospital. Okay, so after three days, how were your legs doing? After 24 hours, my legs were okay. fine. It okay. was just, a man, I think it was, from what the doctors said, the, the pressure drop. at which the plane landed mm. on ground, that was what caused yeah. that. Okay. okay, so was it a choice that you made that I'm going to go back to, was it to go back to Lagos from Abuja? Mm -hmm. Or how did, how did that decision come about? You Sorry, that. Esther, yeah. <laughs> we're, gonna take a, we're gonna take a break, let you think about that and we'll come back to you, okay? And we will be right back after this. If we can control the human factors and manage them really well, then we can mitigate this thing. Yeah. But how much of that human factor is monitored in Nigeria? Dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back. Esther, before the break, we, you told us that after three days, you went back to Lagos. How did you make that 
decision or why did you make that decision to go back? My mother wanted to come to Abuja. Okay. And I didn't want to stress her. Mm. I was fine. She spoke with me the first, when it happened, somewhere in her mind, mm. she just didn't think I was fine. Mm. So she wanted to come and see me. So I said to her, I'm, re I'm really fine. And once the doctors check me and they say I can move, I will come home. Yeah. Okay. Now just to clarify, you decided to go back to Lagos by, by plane. plane, right? How? I could have picked mm. other options, but I was told that the easiest way to get over the phobia was Is the flying to... thing. Okay. Right. So when you were on that flight, how did you feel? I cried all through. Wow. Okay. Especially at the takeoff point because that was when the accident yeah. happened. Yeah. So I cried. They had to put me at the back. Mm. And by the time I started crying, because my oldest brother came to pick me as well, everybody in the aircraft didn't, they didn't know who I was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what had happened to me. They just didn't understand why I was crying right. mm. for flying. And I was crying really hard. And my brother had to just tell them, look, she just survived on Sunday. Mm. And by the time we were touching down in Lagos, everybody was like, you're really brave mm. and all that. After that, you know, you've now gotten to Lagos and you've survived the plane crash. How did you begin to get back into normal life and live normal routines? For a month, I didn't go out, mm. go just hospital home. And then after a month, the first logical thing to do was to have a Thanksgiving. Yeah. So I had a Thanksgiving ceremony at my church. Then from then, whether I liked it or not, I needed my NYC certificate. <laughs> yes. So I had to return back to Sokoto. Wow. And how did you do? You took another plane back to Sokoto? I went by bus. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <Now I'll go. laughs> <laughs> you know, when you, you said that for the first month you had, it's just home and hospital, what were, what were you thinking about? Did you think at any point, did you look back and think about the day you woke up, you said you weren't feeling well, you got to the airport, it was fully booked. Do you look and think, are these signs that I should have just, I'm not meant to travel or what goes through your mind? Then I didn't think about that. Okay. But now, mm. if I have to go somewhere yeah. and it's like the something just you, yeah. doesn't just go well, mm. I'm not going. Yeah. That is what that experience has taught me. Oh. But on the other hand, I look at it as what will be will be. Mm. Um, we're doing this interview in Lagos today because of, or you know that we choose in Calabar. Yeah so that you wouldn't have to fly over to Calabar. How do you feel about flying now? When is the last time you took a domestic flight in Nigeria? A year after. A year after. Okay. After you did Abuja to Lagos, Lagos, was that the last one? That was a break. Mm -hmm. okay. Then after a year, mm -hmm. I went to Abuja again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you remember how that flight was, how you felt? Before that flight, I mm -hmm. said to my God, if this is the last time, mm -hmm. It's your will. It's mm. a 50 50 chance. Mm. Okay. And somewhere deep in my mind, I said to myself, if I make this one, yeah. then it means I'll be okay. Mm. okay. So I went to Abuja and then I came back to Lagos in 2007. And that was the last time I took a domestic flight. Right. The cause of the plane, because mm. I read online that it said it was partially due to you know, the weather, but mm. that it was also partially due to the pilot. Because there happened to have been a Virgin Airlines plane that was supposed to fly before you, but the pilot chose not to fly. But your pilot was told not to fly and he chose to fly. How well, the that? aviation basics, mm. I cannot say much yeah. about that. But one thing I know, because even when I started working, I had to work in the international airport premises mm -hmm. and but I realized something there's so many human factors mm. that goes into a plane taking off and landing okay. mm. and also the weather is a natural thing 
we can't really control that. Mm. But if we can control the human factors and manage them really well, then we can mitigate these things. Yeah. But how much of that human factor is monitored in Nigeria? Very true. Yeah. Very true. That is what I don't have confidence in. Well, Esther, we're going to take another break. Yeah. And when we return, Esther's father is actually going to be here with us. And we're going to get his thoughts on what happened. We'll be right back after this. It was about 11 a.m. Then my phone rang. He said, Daddy, Daddy. I said, yes. He said, the plane has crashed. Mm -hmm. Which plane? Dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. The first call Esther made right after the crash was to her dad. We also had a chat with him to find out his immediate reaction upon learning about the crash. Let's see how that went. So we've heard Esther's story in absolutely shocking but I can't even imagine what it must have been like for you when she called you that day of the crash can you tell us how you felt when she called what were your first thoughts when she told you what had happened thank you that morning that Sunday morning 29th of uh, October 2006 when she was about to leave I was ready to take her she now said mommy won't you see me off mm. the mommy said okay I will see you off I'll see you off she just rushed and uh, we took her to the airport. We dropped her at the airport. Okay. She checked in, like uh, she said, I already narrated, mm -hmm. and the aircraft was airborne, and we left the airport. Typical with me, when I dropped my children at the other motor park, or, or uh, uh, the any departure point, yeah. mm -hmm. if it's the Sunday, I won't go to church that day. Because okay. I always want to be sure mm. that they've arrived at their destination. Okay. If I go to church, I'm just on my own. Because my mind will not be there, yeah. but with the kids. Okay. Well, I bought uh, the Sunday punch. I sat down at the back seat in our sitting room. It was about 11 a.m. Then my phone rang. I looked at the name on the screen. I saw Esther. I thought she wanted to tell me that uh, it's uh, there was a delay at Abuja, okay. yeah. or there was still at Abuja, mm. and all that. So what I said, well, let me just answer the call. So when I pick it up, he said, Daddy, Daddy. I said, yes. He said, the plane has crashed. Mm -hmm. So which plane? Because I served in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. I know what a plane crash means. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once the plane, uh, the plane crashed in my days, we also ask, for who you get the message at, how bad? Because normally when you go down from the air, so the chance is uh, there. Not, it's not, not even 50-50. It's like 99.1. Yeah. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I said, the plane has crashed. But I didn't want mommy to hear Okay. that the plane had crashed. Mm. Because before we left the airport, mommy, the, the aircraft was not there. Esther said the aircraft was, was coming from uh, Calabar. Okay. Mommy now said, ah, Calabar to Lagos. Lagos, Abuja, Abuja, so Sokoto, so Sokoto, back again. Mm. That is in Molue. <laughs> so mommy didn't want her to travel mm. on board that airline. I said, well, and, madam, you don't have a choice. People's life depend on that, fli on that flight. Mm. The air crew, the, uh, the owners of the aircraft, some people going for their business, you got to the first after a very long uh, holiday. I know you have no choice. But you have the choice of stopping your daughter from flying. But don't forget tomorrow, she still has to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, let us leave her in God's hand. Then we parted. So when she sees the plane crashed, I said, ah, mommy must not hear this. Because if she does, I won't hear the other <laughs> the, uh, the continuation of the yeah. story. Then I went into my bedroom. And I said, Star, what, are we, what did you see? He said, the plane. I said, which plane? The one you are inside. He said, yeah, there, but, uh, are you sure? Within me, I said, and you are the one talking to me. Because 2005, we had two plane crashes. Only one piece of person survived out of over 200, about 300 people. Mm -hmm. Then earlier, September of that 2006, we lost a team of uh, very senior military officers. Mm -hmm. Then just about six weeks later, a discipline crash. And you are telling me that, uh, you are the one telling me that the plane has crashed. Yeah. So I said, okay. I asked her, as she said earlier, how are you? Say, fine, daddy. Has anything wrong with your hand? She said, no. Your legs? No. Any jewelry? She said, no. Mm. I said, okay. 
if all this is no, 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 it's all right. Please keep away from that aircraft okay. because it could explode mm. okay. at any time. And once it does, well, it will be the end of everything. So she moved away. I told her that and went back to the sitting room. Mommy now said, asked, who called? I said, Esther. Have they got to uh, Sokoto? I kept quiet. I said, no. And she answered me now. I said, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they did not go back to Sokoto. So he now, he now said, what happened? I said, look. Then I made up my mind to say, look, the aircraft has crashed. Then she shouted, yay, I said it too, I didn't want her to go, I didn't want this, so you are done. I said, thank God, she's that the one she's, calling. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, even there's any other injury, mm. she's, at least she's alive. Yeah. So that was how, but immediately we have to call her friend. She, our other ship, his brother, who was an Air Force officer, he was at Benin. Okay. I had to tell him straight away, that little boy, your plane has a plane, your brother, your sister has a plane crash. Mm. Then some other people, knew that she was traveling that, uh, she was to travel that, my, my very close friends, so she had to travel to Sokoto that uh, Sunday. I think they had the news on CNN. Then so most of them rushed to Naza. Hope your, daddy, your daughter didn't travel. Some, that. So some people believed that she was dead. Mm. Then I said, no, she's alive. I say, hey, are you sure? I said, yes. But that at a point, after uh, telling me that she had the plane, the, after the crash, he told me. I called back, because I told her to keep her phone on. I now called, then there was no response. Hmm. Then I said, are you sure? Then I remember the story of a man in the Lagos, he by the expressway. Mm -hmm. He had an accident in his car. Went to the police station on that road, Lagos up to now, police station. He went to the police station to, come to report mm. that somebody had a crash somewhere there. When the policeman got there, they found the, that it was that same person yeah. mm. with the same dress that came to report the case. I said, I hope Esther is not here, it's be her ghost. Oh. It's not easy. When yeah. I call her, she didn't answer me again. Yeah. Then somebody, somebody just came to me and said, she told me that her mother, uh, that her mother, Mr. Esther, her, her, Esther, her, her second Esther, was on board. And I called that one. Then that one answered, and answered me. I said, God. I said, what are you people? So we're inside the ambulance. I said, okay. That's when I believed that mm. she made it. Wow. That's very, very courageous. So Esther, what would you say is your outlook on life now? Has your lifestyle changed? Has anything changed? drastically since since the crash the one thing that has changed is it really doesn't matter how i look it really mm. doesn't matter what i have mm. yeah what the most important thing is i can breathe in and breathe out yeah life that's amazing, that's amazing. what they say don't sweat the small I stuff know, don't sweat small stuff yeah. Oh. And that's I can see, I mean, it seems as though you've carried on in your living life because you're mm -hmm. married yeah. now, aren't you? And how long have you been married for? Uh, going to be four years okay. this year. Amazing. It's really cool. Yeah. I mean, your story is amazing, one of survival, extreme survival. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you. And we're back to the studio now. After the break, it's a cocktail of books, tips and comments. Stay right there. I raised this word I raised this that word. the cry of the poor will never let you reach the sleep. The they, they cannot sleep. They cannot because one race cry. Because one race cry. Because one race cry. Dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank. In your best interest. Welcome back. Today's showcase feature is very interesting. Check it out. I raised this word. I raised this word. That the cry of the poor will never let you reach sleep. sleep. They cannot sleep. They cannot sleep. Because always cry. Because always cry. Because always cry. My name is Consign Felicia Audi Martins, the national coordinator to SOSET Charity Organization. SOSET means Society for the Safety of the Insane and Destitutes. While I was having my children, I was into nursing. So after some time, I felt I want to study more. So I left for Lagos State University where I went to study law at uh, Lasso on Badagri Express Road. I was there studying law until I got to my 300 level when I now had inspiration for the destitutes on the streets. So my own calling, coming to be picking up lunatics, mentally challenged off the streets, no matter the kind of issues they have, 
All of a sudden, she told me she wants to take care of the insane. We were quarreling, hoping that she will change. She's still sick in taking care of the insane. To the extent that my son slapped me, that I was bringing disgrace to the family, to the extent that they all fought and kicked against it until I was thrown out of the house for eight good months. We have a, a team, a social welfare that goes out with our team. We pick these people here. As my national coordinator has always said, we clean them up, take them for checkups, so able to know their mental status and balance, so that we can be able to know where and where we can be able to address them in their own way and in our own understanding. When the person is okay now, we just try her in the workshop. We put her in the workshop. With so many different acquisitions in the shop, you see the area she's doing well. That's the area she's going to, uh, you know, be established to. So since I was brought uh, back from. Uh, from the street, from the Yama Baptist Church, that have been habilitated, have been given uh, duties like uh, housekeeping, you know, washing the floor, sweeping, uh, helping in the kitchen, and uh, now in the admin section, assisting, filing. I'm a good missionary, I'm an evangelist at a mom, so right. believe me, that's really what I think I am doing here. Many that have been reconciled back to their families. A total number we have been able to reconcile is 170 from 10 years ago till now. My husband, the man that chased me out and hate my vision, who has joined me today, at least before he goes to his own business, he will first beat their music for them in the morning, they'll be dancing. Just two days ago, I was watching him from upstairs, beating music for them to do their fellowship and he was sweating. Even those my children, you know, who were not interested then, they are only interested now because they saw the pressure of work on me and they felt they don't want to lose me and God touched their hearts. Today they are happy. That shows you that life is not permanent for you. It takes the grace of God for you to maintain anything you think you are or you have. Wow. I mean, that's very, you know what, you know what, I, it hit me when I was watching that video. Every time that, you know, I'm driving down the street mm. and I see someone who is mentally channeled, mm. someone who is, you know, dealing with some sort of issue and we would call the person mad or crazy. Mm. I've always wondered and thought the amount of fear that we have towards them is really, it's, to me, it's almost, it's silly mm. because here's someone who is having a problem and it, I've always wondered where are the institutions that are yeah. helping them? Yeah. And for me to see that is very, very encouraging. Um, there's a stigma against people that are mentally challenged. But the video also shows you that there's a stigma against people trying to help. You know, she said her own family thought she was crazy. She mm. was out of the house for eight months. Um, but now her husband is there in the morning beating the drums yeah. so that they can dance. Yeah. Uh, to the point where her son slapped her. You know, it's like you would think with reason that what she's doing is so amazing and mm -hmm. she's helping so many people. Yeah. And, you know, there was a, a lady there that she'd actually helped and you could see she was completely sane. Yeah. So... It's just strange that there's a, it's not just a stigma with people who are mentally challenged, people who are trying to help mentally challenged, which it can deter people from trying to help people. But you can see in that video, she, like you said, she's had so many success stories. Yeah. And that's a great thing. You know? Definitely. It's very inspiring, very mm. inspiring story. Up next, we have a health tip and a financial tip when we return. This chapter is about boldness. So let me just share what he says. He says, here are some suggestions to help you step out in boldness. Dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back and it's time for our health tip. Eating a good breakfast helps give your brain the boost it needs to stay sharp all day. Before you buy a breakfast cereal, check the nutrition label to be sure the cereal contains at least 2.5 grams of fiber per serving. Mm. You know, a lot I of breakfast cereals fiber. actually, <laughs> a lot of breakfast cereals have sugar. Yeah. A lot of I mean, sugar. There was one so breakfast cereal I, that I was I really looking at and per serving, I believe it had like 10 grams of sugar and then it was calling itself a healthy That's breakfast cereal. Thing. And I thought to myself, really? You know, the, you know what I found? Mm. The only cereals that are actually truly healthy mm. are bran cereals. Yeah. Cereals that are bran flakes, bran whatever. Mm. If it's bran, that's the only time that most likely the sugar content is going to be very, very yeah. low. 
and the brown ones definitely have a definitely high in fiber. So I'm pretty sure that per serving they would have at least the 2.5 grams. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, and of course, oatmeal is another good one to mm, get. You can get some fiber. There, but it's, you, I know it's great. Yeah, I know. you can get some fiber, like and of course, you can add sugar to the quantity that you desire. Mm. I love fiber. I love oatmeal. Really? Yes. Yes, mm. I'm quite obsessed about making sure I get that fiber in. <laughs> All right, what's our book review for today? So our book for today is called Soaring with Eagles, and it's by Bill Newman. Mm. And I mean, we're always trying to share books here that tell people about how to be successful and how to kind of make sure that you're living the life that you were intended to. So I am going to share some of his, you know, tips. Um, this chapter is about boldness. And when I was reading this chapter, I felt so, um, what's the word, convicted? Because I thought to myself, I was like, huh, I need to do these things more. Mm. So let me just share what he says. He says, here are some suggestions to help you step out in boldness. And this is part of, this, this is tips of ways of being successful. Um, he says that you should speak to people. I know, right? <laughs> he says there's nothing nice. There's nothing nicer than a cheerful greeting. Um, mm. He's also this one. I was like, hmm, need to remember this on bad days. He says that we should smile at people. It takes 72 muscles to frown and only 14 yes, to smile. Yes, they say that. But you think smiling because your mouth is going up. So it's like, but when you're frowning, think of all the think of all the work that's going on right here. Just like yeah, true. You know what I mean? I love it sometimes when um, Rita, our makeup artist, is doing my makeup and she says, but you're frowning, your brows. Oh, and really? I'll be like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I was frowning. <laughs> like, why is my forehead crinkle? Yeah. But um, let me, sh the, this one, I, this one was also another tip. He says, be genuinely interested in people. Yeah. This one gets me because I know there are so many times where I've met people and people have met me and I can tell when the person is feign pretending to be, like, oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just irks me. The so it's like I'd rather way. just didn't even. It's like I'd rather not even talk yeah. to you. And then he also says, says that we should um, make sure that we should give more. Um, we should give more encouragement than more criticism. Mm. Definitely, criticism is helpful, but be quick to give encouragement and slow to give and criticism. Fo focus on the positives. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought it was a really good book, and it's really short too. That's why I liked it. Yeah, you guys can see my excitement. I, I really actually love this book. So, If you have a book that you'd like us to review, you can send us an email or you can tweet at us. Up next, we also have a financial tip, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Today's financial tip is courtesy of Zenith Bank. If you must survive harsh economy, you have to tune up your skills. If you have access to the on-the-job training or your current employer will subsidize outside classes, then keep upgrading your abilities. By taking action, you take control of the situation. You know, there, the great thing is that there's a lot of, I don't want to say so many because I'm not that sure, a lot of establishments, like for example, where my cousin works, and you can take courses while you're working. I'm not saying like you'll take time off, mm. but maybe at night and the company pays so that you reach a higher level in the company. Yeah, it's you basically know. the concept of uh, it's important that a company invests in its in talent. Your, thank I you. know that there's some companies that actually call it talent management mm. and it's not, they're not an entertainment company. Yeah. They're, you know, normal nine to five. They yeah. call it, they think that it's important that you invest in the people mm. that you're employed because if they don't feel like they're growing, whatever you've poured into them, they're bound to leave. Yeah, and then use... Their use skills their skills elsewhere, elsewhere. You yeah know, so it's definitely i think that's a fantastic idea yeah all right now it's time for your questions or your comments let's see what we have here today first up we have joanne and she says hi i don't live in africa but i remember watching your show on tv when i traveled to ghana is there any way i can catch more of these episodes outside of africa well joanne um we don't have full episodes per mm -hmm. se but you can catch up to 30 minutes of our episodes online all you have to do is head to youtube and if you just type in ebony life tv in the search engine you'll be able to see the different things that come up yeah which is always really good. Yeah. Or do you, well, you could just move to Africa so you can watch the show. That's a thought. <laughs> uh, That's a good point. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we have Tosin from Ibadan, and He says, the episode with Bobby had me in stitches. You should do more episodes with comedians. I yeah. love that episode. It was a lot of fun. It was, it, I think what was fun was kind of the fact that the comedians were willing to kind of be thrown under the bus or to just yeah. let Bobby, you know, scrutinize their work. Yeah. And, and also... He, was really, he gave them some really helpful tips. I just kept He saying, knows his stuff. I know. That's what I kept thinking because I was like, he knows his craft because mm. he was like do this don't do that do this and it was just like bam bam yeah. he should have a, a comedy talent show yeah or like a doesn't say a school but well, <laughs> whatever talent something talent show talent school we can talent. start like a, a you, know. you know something's got talent for yeah, comedians yeah exactly yeah mm, nice one 
Thank you for your questions. If you have a question or comment, we'd love to hear from you. All you have to do is send us an email, visit our Twitter handle or Facebook page. Tonight's episode has been extremely eye-opening. We hope that you feel the same. And we will see you in the next episode of Moments with Mo. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Moments with Mo was brought to you by Zenith Bank and GE.